just introduce myself, uh, Todd Miller. I'm with a project called Chrome Away. Um, we're uh, the developer of a layer one blockchain called Chromia. Uh, so we build like infrastructure for different apps, uh, different use cases across a number of different verticals, including gaming, supply chain, um, fashion, and we're actually quite involved in uh, property in this sort of real world assets. Quite interested um, and look forward to the panel this morning. I'll, I'll pass it down to, uh, to Assad to introduce himself. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you Todd for putting this together. I yeah. think it's awesome. I'm happy to be speaking alongside such an esteemed panel here. Uh, my name is Assad Khan. I do protocol partnerships for Centrifuge. For those who don't know, Centrifuge is a decentralized protocol for real world assets. We've worked with MakerDAO and Aave and the whole DeFi ecosystem to bring RWAs on chain. Yep, thanks, Todd, for having yeah. us. And um, I'm Aaron, uh, working at Goldfinch. I work on the credit side of the business. So what we do is, similar to Centrifuge, provide dollar-denominated loans and stable coins to real-world businesses. And I work on the borrower-facing side, so really bringing that traditional finance, all those off-world, real-world docs on-chain in order to kind of do private debt through blockchain-enabled technology. Yeah, for sure, and, and, and again, uh, these these two projects uh, in this this emerging field of uh, real world assets on chain. I mean, they're they're really two of the leading projects in the world. So it's fun to spend a little time this morning speaking with them. Uh, first of all, let's let's just do some definitions because for some folks in the audience, this might be sort of a new concept. We're used to the use of maybe virtual assets on chains and so forth, but maybe we could talk a little bit about what does it mean, what does a real world asset protocol really mean? And Aaron, maybe we'll start with you to get your take on that. Yeah, sure. So real world asset protocol from our perspective is taking traditional financial products off chain and bringing exposure to them on chain. Um, the other thing I would say to define real world asset products are products that are uncorrelated from crypto risk. And I think there's a lot of different competing definitions here. Um, some people think that unsecured credit to any type of entity is a real world asset. You could define a real world asset as something as simple as US, you know, USDC is a real world asset. The way that we think about it is a private debt product that's from the real world derives um, return from the real world and we can return that back on chain. But as I, as I mentioned, there's a lot of room for innovation and there's a lot of real world asset space in the primary market, secondary market. It really depends a lot on how you define it, but I think most of the protocols to date have been focused on the debt markets when we talk about RWA. Nice. Yeah, and Asad, what, what's, what's your take on uh, defining uh, what the space is all about? Yeah, I think everything Aaron said is, is the way I think about it as well and where, where we think at Centrifuge. But I think what's important to highlight here as well, and this goes for Goldfinch and Centrifuge, is that real world assets really presents an opportunity to fix like fundamental challenges in traditional finance. So you look at Goldfinch, who's working in emerging markets, and you think about the challenges that emerging markets have in accessing financing, the lack of infrastructure, how underdeveloped or underserved those markets are you know, compared to traditional financial flows. And then you look at Centrifuge and our real kind of, you know, our, our reason for being here is really SME financing. So you look at the private credit markets the, for the smallest businesses, which make up 80% of the world's businesses by volume. They just continually lack the funds and financing that they need, especially, you know, compared to how big traditional financial markets grow. It just doesn't really make sense. And I think this points out fundamental issues in financial infrastructure and financial flows and the way that systems are actually built and designed around finance. And so for both Goldfinch and Centrifuge and real-world asset protocols in general, it's a really great opportunity to look at the problems traditional finance has, use new technology and innovative approaches in digital financing to then address real problems, bring together new markets, build into niches. And to me, that's, what I think, a definitive aspect of a real-world asset protocol. Yeah, and maybe just to add on that, I think one of the really cool things about crypto is that real-world assets in the real world over the last 10 years of regulation and QE have really been incentivized to put their money in safe, rated securities to big corporates and especially in emerging markets where there's not a ton of credit to give out. Why wouldn't you lend to the best corporate within the country? But I think that undercuts the fundamental view that finance has to create returns 
I mean, growth has to create returns greater than the financial returns. And so where are you going to find those kind of returns? It's with SMEs. It's with businesses that need finance but aren't getting it. So I just think our traditional financial world has not only become too cumbersome and too many transaction costs, but it's also just changed the preferences to continue channeling money into places where there's already very strong flows. Yeah, I just even just like to bring it down a couple levels. Um, if I go to the Centrifuge website or I go to um, uh, Goldfinch, which is the Warboat Labs project, what I'm looking at pools. Can can you describe like the the kind of process that what 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 am I seeing in those pools and is what are the different roles in the uh, for example we'll start with you Assad in the in the centrifuge process from an yeah. investor and so forth. And yeah, I think the, the the way to think about it is you have you know assets coming in from the issuance side of the business and. You know, the reason we're here at NFT NYC, and this is true of Goldfinch as well, is that we're actually tokenizing those underlying assets. So there's some sort of financial collateral, there's a loan agreement, there's a house that's being lent against, that's being tokenized, brought on chain, that's the issuance side of the business. And then you have investors on the other side. And traditionally, in traditional finance, I think it's like a good opportunity to highlight the differences here, you make an investment to a, you know, just a traditional loan contract, you have no real idea what's going on. There's a document somewhere, someone owns an Excel sheet, they're responsible for updating it all. Instead, in the centrifuge platform, you're doing everything on chain. So there's a set of smart contracts that's documenting your investment. There's a tokenized representation of both the collateral and the investment. That's all automated and programmed so that only cash is flowing when it should be according to the conditions set both in the smart contracts and the legal documents. And then you know the investor is able to see actually what's happening by looking at the pool, right? So the pool is just a way of intermediating the investors and then the, the asset issuers on the other side of it. And that's the way I think about it. Nice. And then, yeah, Aaron, yeah. on your side, on the Goldfin side. It, it works in a similar way for us. We also have two types of pools. Our senior pool is actually a token rather than an NFT that allocates money to every single of our junior pools and then accrues value, as in like pick interest, and then you can redeem it for a greater value. But our junior pool, similar to Centrifuge, is captured as NFTs. The other aspect of NFTs that comes into our business is that in order to invest in a pool or withdraw from a pool, you have to go and mint a soul bound token that says, I've gone through your KYC process. And if you have that KYC NFT and a loan pool NFT, you just go onto our site, connect your wallet, and you can reclaim your interest. What I think is really cool about loans as NFTs is that think about what this industry looks like in the real world. It's private credit. It's in the name. It gets lots of value by being very private. When you, when you look at private debt, loan docs, like there's all sorts of transferability restrictions, all sorts of minimum ticket sizes. Whereas bring that on chain, we now have investors who can invest as little as you know a dollar, but let's say $100. They get an NFT of it that looks like a loot card that says you've given 100 bucks, here's what the interest rate is, here's when it's due, and you can go trade that on a secondary market. Like, not only are you able to immediately access your economic position in this financial product, but you're actually able to understand it, transfer it, and kind of have more composability from an industry that previously you would only be able to access if you were a big boy and were able to take a full size ticket. Yeah, maybe just to add to that, right? If you think about how this works in traditional finance, there is actually no single software system that allows you to do all the things Aaron just mentioned, right? From tracking and accounting where, you know, what the investment portfolio looks like, what the actual investments are, to then documenting the waterfall and the cash flows and how should they flow out, the conditions of the loan, the status of the loan. On a blockchain system, you're not bringing all of this stuff on chain, you're integrating digital systems up that are off-chain, but more fluidly, you're using cryptographic verification to make sure you have a chain of authenticity the whole way down. That really is something that doesn't exist for private credit anywhere in the world, which I think is what makes this industry so fascinating and which is such a good opportunity to disrupt traditional finance and like mm. live up to the whole kind of crypto ideal, right? So I can go, for example, I can, I can go on chain, I can look at the cap table to see what, what's been the allocation of tokens for that particular asset and so forth. Yeah, and in the Centrifuge platform, I'm sure it works similarly in Goldfinch as well. You can go to assets, and the asset metadata is captured on chain, so you can see when an asset is due, when it's late, how many payments have been made on it, for example. And then Centrifuge has built kind of this privacy tokenization layer where we keep the private data off chain and you know separated from the on chain data, but it's still in a way that you can go and see and make sure that, okay, the loan details were 
this X, Y, and Z that's kept off chain, and that actually is tied to this NFT that I'm looking at. So you have this kind of chain of connection down to the asset level, you know, this asset level NFT data, which I do think is just, it, that's kind of the, the power and the thing that drives this whole space. Yeah, Aaron, specifically, uh, what, you mentioned this, what, what are some of the pools, what are some of the investment assets? I know you, you, you guys uh, are funding a lot of projects in the developing world and so forth with DeFi, uh, I think FinTech projects and so forth. Maybe you could talk about those a little bit. Yeah, sure. So a majority of our portfolio is in emerging markets, about 75%. We're spread out across 20, more than 20 emerging markets in South America, Africa, Southeast Asia. Um, and as you were saying, most of our borrowers are fintechs or the credit funds who lend to fintechs. So we always are giving money to an originator who then goes and originates their loans off chain and we're secured by those loans. We actually have a deal that's live on our platform right now, just to give you a sense of what things look like. It's a company called Faz that's recently raised $75 million a few months ago. And to really show how strong lender um, power is at the moment, these guys are offering a 14.5% coupon with a three month investor call option. I tried to do the same deal with these guys like two years ago and I got like 9% for a three year tenor deal. So I just think, especially in this middle market space we're talking about that's underserved, there's a lot of good businesses that will really be willing to pay up as rates increase. And I think we're gonna start seeing a lot more of that capital start to unlock after the last six months of people sitting on their hands and trying to figure out where the Fed goes. Nice. And then, uh, yeah, you, you mentioned this in terms of, uh, I guess, the liquidity question in terms of most, most alternative asset investments are for long term, there might be locked up periods of three to five years. In this case, you, you mentioned there's a call option early. So this is a, another feature that can maybe be provided in this space? Yeah, I think this is one of the real challenges of RWA is that for finance to actually do its job, it needs to go out into the real economy and be put to work and get a return. So immediate liquidity that you can get in normal DeFi is kind of illogical. It would be impossible. You can't just call money back from a business immediately. And so we were doing what is conventional within our in the private debt space, doing kind of two to four year term loans. But during the bear market, we went and interviewed like 100 different investors and said, hey, what are your pain points? And a lot of crypto investors say, I've come to expect instant liquidity in my yield farming. And I can run a yield fund and potentially take three to six month you know, risk on duration, but no more than that. And so that's why we developed this call option on top of a longer tenor loan, because you really have to meet people where they're at and just assuming that everybody in crypto is gonna understand private debt as an asset class and how money gets put to work is, uh, is naive. And so we, we met them in the middle and said, hey, this three month callable feature helps people to get the liquidity while at the same time serving the purpose of actually putting the money to work. Interesting, in a connected way, um, Asad, um, Centrifuge is using some of the DeFi protocols like MakerDAO yeah. and Aave and so forth. Could you talk about that a little bit? As an, it's an it's a additional source of funds for, the, for, the, for these uh, for these pools. Yeah, I think there's two ways to think about it. You know, from uh, the borrower side of things, you're going to a pool of capital that exists. It doesn't really matter where that pool of capital is or what it's coming from. And you're connecting that to real world asset borrowers, right? So you're saying, here are real business needs, here's the risk percentages that you're gonna deal with here. And then we're using the blockchain to kind of connect DeFi native organizations to allow that liquidity to flow into real world assets and in return, they get real world asset yields. From the perspective of the protocol, and in this case, we've been working with Dai, we've been doing some work with Aave, you know, we've been very vocal about wanting to work with Aave Go, which is their new stablecoin they're launching. If you're a stablecoin, especially a digital, you know, stablecoin, digitally native, decentralized stablecoin, your core market is crypto native products, right? So you integrate with all the crypto native lending markets, you integrate against ETH and BTC, things like that. You end up running into this problem where your market is very volatile. You know, your supply can contract by a billion dollars in a day, if you, if, you know, depending on conditions. What real world asset lending provides them is actually a super critical portion of their business. And it's not just revenue, it's really stability. It's the ability to take their balance sheet, 
kind of carve out some of that volatility, provide more stable yields. And Aaron said it earlier, it's uncorrelated yields to crypto. So for a digital business, it's a huge opportunity for them as diversification. And if you're a stable coin in which you live and die by your balance sheet and the characteristics of it, this is now an enabling feature that allows them to grow, it allows them to expand, it provides stability to keep revenue going during a bear market. That's been one of the big things we've seen is as crypto native yields have fallen, you know. I mean, Aaron talked about it earlier, real world asset yields have actually gone up and gotten better, right? And that's just, you know, characteristic of the macro conditions as well. But I think it's also reflective of where the crypto markets are in, th in their development. They're, they're quite immature, quite nascent, even after all these years. And you have the ability to access the most liquid markets in the world or just incredible large economic flows. And, and that's kind of, a, I think, a really game-changing opportunity for DeFi protocols, especially for stable coins. So that, that's, that's, I think, something that's unique to what we're trying to do is we're trying to really connect DeFi capital markets to real-world assets. And taking that perspective of thinking like a stable coin, thinking like a protocol, is really important to do that. And the part of the discussion with those protocols is getting them comfortable with this alternative asset. I mean, they may be holding, they're backed by U.S. dollars or they're backed by uh, some money markets or other sort of, you know, commercial paper or something, but in this case, it's it could be you know a, a, fin, uh, a, a fintech product or something, or you know it could be uh, residential lending things like that. It starts to look like you know these DeFi protocols, especially the ones that have size. If you look at the Dai stablecoin, it starts to look very much like a uh, an institutional investor in the traditional finance world, where they have to now completely diversify their balance sheet, take kind of like the Yale portfolio approach, and really pick a wide group and wide range of asset allocations to really balance and manage through you know, various economic times. So in the beginning, when interest rates were down, really the opportunity was more in private credit. You weren't going to get anything in government bonds. Now as you know, the markets have changed and rates are up, there's an opportunity now to go back into government bonds, accrue yield on that. But I think most importantly is the idea of diversification. And yeah, to your point, like you know, getting DeFi protocols comfortable with real asset lending I think has been um, you know, it's part of the business, right, the, of what Goldfinch and Centrifuge have to do. And so the call of the loans idea, I think, is really great, right? We built revolving pools, which has its own challenges. It's a unique kind of take on how do you provide liquidity. It's a little friendly to the borrower or the investor, but it's very challenging for the borrower. And so trying to, like, work through these things is really a lot about education. You know, here's the risk you're going to take. Here's the trade-offs you're going to get. You know, what can we do to implement things to help mitigate those trade-offs or make the risk profile meet the needs of the investor better? And you know, that's kind of the, the art of making this all scale, right? Great. And then um, I know from being at the conference the last couple of days, I think the number one topic has probably been regulation. Uh, that, of course, uh, that's to some degree that's an advantage of the space because both of your projects have always delved in the reg accepted that this is a, a ticket to be in this industry. So, Aaron, w can you talk a little bit about like? how you sort of navigate around the regulation, with the regulation and so forth, both here and, and abroad? Yeah, I think one of the things was being very KYC forward. So our NFT that captures your KYC information is actually used by some other protocols. I think it was one of the first of its kind, um, and it's actually one of the only products that our dev team owns. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, you just have to have a very good lawyer, right? <laughs> like our GC was the former GC of Binance US and I just like know that he knows some of these things. Um, and so I think, I, think, but it, I think it means you have to also be willing to pull the plug on a project if things change. There's a, lot, there's a few projects that we've spent a ton of time on and then we get to the last couple weeks and something happens in the regulatory landscape and you say, hey, you know, maybe this is allowed, but maybe it's not. And so let's, let's grab this. You have to kind of be unemotional about stuff and be able to move with the times. The other thing that we did really early on was we didn't accept any US money. And now we only accept US accredited money, um, which is part of our KYC verification process as well. Um, but yeah, I think you just have to be incredibly nimble, uh, especially you know, being a US-based team at the moment. Yeah, I saw, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, if you do real world asset lending or real world asset businesses of any type, you have to have one foot in the real world, which means you know you have to straddle the regulations very seriously. And I think you know 
Aaron, you're being humble about it, right? Goldfinch was one of the first platforms to really do token gating and soul bound tokens and KYC in a way that was really tokenized. You know, we, we do it as well at Centrifuge. It's been KYC from the beginning. And I mean, it's, it's not the fun part of the business and it's a Friday, so I won't go too far into the legal and regs, but <laughs> it's, it's an evolving conversation and it's uh, an evolving challenge. But in so many ways too, I think it's also like a very mature part of the business and that we're very aware of this and we have to deal with it and we integrate it well. And, you know, some of the magic, if you're really talking about it, is kind of the integration of legal structures with on-chain structures and making that all work in a fluid way. Yeah. One other thing I would say is that, you know, it's been very helpful on the lender side to have KYC, but it's also great on the borrower side. Yeah. I make all of my borrowers go and mint their KYC NFT, and I can say, hey, lenders, go check out this, this uh, borrower's KYC. This is a real business. They're not just some shell company that's trying to steal your money. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, we only have a couple minutes left. I mean, I, I was just to comment that, uh, interestingly, our project works in a lot of different verticals. I mentioned sort of gaming and so forth, but um, in, in this space around world assets has sort of borrowed a lot, I think learned a lot from what's going on in sort of the virtual world about the use of NFTs, about the sort of taking what's been sort of the plumbing in the sort of to native token world and bringing it to real world assets. But I think in this case, there's gonna be opportunity for folks who are more involved with, uh, 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 with uh, native tokens or with, uh, with NFTs and so forth to learn about the dealing in the real world and so forth because clearly that regulation is coming. I mentioned around KYC and AML and so forth and about dealing with the insecurities regulation. So I think there's a lot of good dialogue that can go on between the, the two industries. Uh, I think we only have like a minute left. Any, and Aaron, any, any wrap up that you wanna summary? Like what's your, uh, may, maybe a little bit about, uh, hey, we're in this market. How do you see like the next like six to nine months maybe from a, from a Goldfinch? Yeah, good question. I think like, we grew from zero to 100 million AUM within a year during the bull market, pretty easy to be honest. And then we've kind of been working on a lot of product, doing product market fit work for the past six months. I would say for the next six to nine months, we have to see traditional institutions get curious about crypto again. Uh, and we also have to see another bull run, well, maybe not another bull run in the next six to nine months, but a, a pickup in momentum so that there's more wealth being accumulated on chain because effectively our total addressable market is defined by how much USDC there is in the world. So I need people to be making a lot of money on Ethereum, turning it over to dollars and then investing that way. So I would say next six to nine months, I think also on the macro side, private debt markets are starting to calm down. People are willing to allocate, but it'll be more of a normalization for the next six to nine months to build the building blocks to kind of uh, scale the next level of growth. Yeah, yeah from our side, actually, the way I'll put it is that, you know, bear markets are about building, but I actually think what's really interesting about this bear market has been the level of conversations we've been having and the depth and the maturity has just been increasing every day, right? So we've come from a place where there's a huge bull market, really frothy, you know, things have turned over now, they're upside down. And then rather than people being afraid and running away entirely, they're actually coming back and saying, okay, you know, how should I avoid this in the next time? They're becoming more sophisticated and they're starting to realize, you know, the benefits of secured lending, the benefits of um, safer yields, right? The risk correlation return. And I think that those conversations are increasing. The institutions are starting to catch on to that. They're starting to get more involved. And so when macro conditions change, when, whenever that is, you know, trying to predict the, the future is always hard. I think the next bull cycle, real world assets will be a big part of it. And I think it'll be a very, very different market than what we've seen recently. Great. So uh, uh, enjoy it. Always enjoy talking to you guys. If I think what we'll do is uh, be outside for a few minutes if you want to come by. If you're interested as a borrower, perhaps in, in looking at these protocols or you're an investor and so forth, uh, you know, talk to these guys, really, uh, really cutting edge, exciting, uh, growth oriented stuff they're working on. So thank you for coming this morning too. Thanks so much, Todd. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, yeah.